Hey, good morning, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Savor Food and Body. I am your host, Amanda Bola, an anti-diet registered dietitian and certified intuitive eating counselor. And today I'm with Janelle Bannett. She has a master's of science in organizational leadership, and she specializes in working with physicians around leadership, coaching, and development. And we have been having some really interesting conversations around neuroscience and how neuroscience can tie into our relationship with food. So I'm going to let her introduce herself a little bit more and we'll dive into what does she do for work and then how is that related even into her relationship with foods. It's going to be a really great conversation. Janelle, thanks so much for being here today. Thanks for taking the time. It's great to have you. Thanks for having me, Amanda. So let us uh, dig, let's dig into a little bit what you do specifically around um, helping physicians and 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 not just even your everyday physicians, right? You're working with whole physician groups, whole practices. So tell us a little bit more about what you do. Yeah, thanks. Um, we actually, my company, Footland Consulting, specializes in helping physicians and physician leaders be uh, able to understand their strengths and develop more confidence in their competence as leaders. We fill some, some gaps for them in a consultative way, but for the most part, we help them just work through some of their own barriers that are keeping them back, be it imposter syndrome or their inner critics going nuts, or just to be honest, all the triggers that are out there um, long before COVID, but even now with COVID that really keep people from being able to function at their best, just the basic stressors of life that end up getting in the way of their uh, cognitive functioning abilities, much like anyone else. Doctors deal with this too, and we're helping them with that. Um, I have a team of coaches, uh, at least 20 now, I think, that work for me and um, help me deliver a lot of these neuroscience research-based tools that we've found are the best ones that seem to really help doctors out. We also work with lawyers. Lawyers are funding us too. They have some of the similar kind of struggles and other business leaders as well. Um, but we really are driven to help doctors and lighten their loads with these tools. A lot of neuroscience research, stuff I didn't create, just uh, stuff really smart people thought of, and I've started using it in a different way, uh, leveraging some of the learnings that they've had and helping these docs out in this space. And then getting to work with you, um, because I don't go, I tell people as a coach and an owner of a coaching company, I actually don't go more than six months to a year without hiring a coach of my own. And sometimes that's around my business, helping my business be quicker in responding to things, helping me get through my own self-limiting beliefs about what I'm capable of or what past people's judgment was, letting all that stuff go and getting it out of there. Um, or sometimes I end up focusing on my health. So I got to start working with you, I guess, in maybe August, July of last year, somewhere yeah, around there. Something like that. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it was, it was time to focus on Janelle and um, Janelle's health a little bit. So going through some super fun early menopause stuff that um, you helped me really get a little bit more comfortable with a lot of these changes in my body and be less judgy and um, toxic, to be honest, some of the things that we get hung up on. So it's been really, really helpful, really good journey. Yeah, I think what you said, we don't often give doctors enough credit for all of the stresses that they go through. I mean, and even some of those other, you know, major leadership type roles that we think of as a collective society and the amount of pressure that they're under. And even when we think about something as basic as feeding ourselves, but when we've got so much other stress in our life or we're amped up, we're dysregulated, that's a term that gets used in in at least my end of this work. I don't know if that comes up for you and reading the neuroscience too, but um, it when we have all of this other stress, either from work pressures, uh, then it becomes hard to feed ourselves or hard to get in touch with what is our own innate wisdom, which is so important around food and just helping you move forward in life in general. And through the conversations that you and I've had, it sounds like that's what's similar to the work that you're doing with these professionals is just trying to help them like get back into their body, get back into their embodied experience and recognize like, okay, what's a real threat? What's a 
not as important threat, like how can we prioritize these things so that you can learn to take care of yourself? And whether that's from getting more sleep, drinking some more water, go moving your body or eating on a regular basis. I don't know how many clients that I've had that would also probably likely be clients of yours too, that are running at such a high level that they're like, oh, lunch? What is that? No, no, there was some grabbing of this and that. And by four o'clock in the mm-hmm. afternoon, we're starving and we wonder why we ate the whole box of crackers and the the whole log of cheese or whatever, the whole bottle of wine. And not that having as much of that as you want is a bad thing, but they're recognizing that that's happening because they're so checked out and they just didn't feed themselves throughout the day. So, yeah. And then the guilt associated with that, because all of the things that get made up about what they're doing, what we're doing to our bodies when that kind of things happens and what is this doing to my health and Um, my work with you, to be honest, having been in healthcare for 30 years in multiple roles, I've been very strongly exposed to the research that's been out there about being, uh, heavier in weight is actually really unhealthy. So that was a big part of what I needed to help get undone. Um, and your, your leadership towards getting me aware of a lot of Lindo Bacon's work, um, at health in every size and body respects and all of the research they put together in the space that actually negates a lot of what we all have learned is true was really fascinating. I mean, that was just such a walk down a road of cognitive dissonance. It was almost painful. And I, you probably remember, I fought you on it on a few times. It's like, no, that's not right. Um, Really good uh, coaching and counseling going on here, which has been super helpful. So yeah, that, that is, that is strongly guiding physicians as well. And I don't even talk to doctors about their food intake or their body image or, um, any of the things that you discuss. I mean, we talk sometimes, you know, girl to girl or something about, oh, and I'm having a hard time because I don't have time to pee. I'm barely even having time to sleep and I'm eating like crap and I'm starting to feel like shit and I don't really appreciate this, but I know it's, it's not good. And I'm, I'm not being healthy and just learning that some of those additional stressors are unnecessary that based on the research, no, you're not necessarily actually becoming more unhealthy. Um, you might be giving your body what it needs at this point in time. And that's just fine. So there's, you know, all those additional stressors we put on ourselves mentally because of the threat state that gets caused by all of the hangups and the toxicity of the diet culture that we've all been raised on is probably causing us more harm than anything we're actually putting in our mouths. And that's been a big aha too. And knowing what I know about stress and what it does to the body in every other aspect of um, how it functions, it, is, it has been pretty interesting to see this whole other side and angle of things layered on top of what I know. Yeah, something you said earlier too, when you talked about addressing the perfectionism and the imposter syndrome and all of that in, in the clients that you work with. And I've had a few other clients that are medical professionals too. And there is this expectation that you are living your healthiest self, you're living your healthiest life because this is your profession. Like, you know, should know everything there is to know about health and you should be living your life that way. Like we put physicians on such a pedestal around this is the way they should be living, which in reality, and I've learned this through working with you, like they're hanging on by threads at times. And I've seen this with, well, like I said, with the other clients that I've worked with. And, and so really helping them just get back to that basics and even just addressing that perfectionism saying, Hey, guess what? You're human and recognizing where that perfectionism mindset comes from. And when that, sometimes that mindset is fueled by all of that other scientific evidence that is more weight centric and is pinpointing towards this is the way to eat and this is the way to move your body, um, which as you and Mm -hmm. I've talked about, a lot of those studies don't have longevity to them and don't have follow through. And so that's where the holes lie in making recommendations based off of those studies, but that's what they're taught. Just like you said, that's what you had been taught for 30 plus years, like that's part of that culture. And so I imagine 
you know, if someone kind of came in and challenged a doc on that, like flipped that their, their ideas on their head, like talk about another stressor. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I'm wondering if you can yeah. um, dive in a little bit to like, what have you experienced? Like you mentioned threat state, and I know that was a big aha that came up in one of our sessions. Uh, I think it was after I told you to do the work. <laughs> <laughs> we, yeah, probably. <laughs> like you said, I challenged you on it a little bit. And and it's true, like you have to get in and just like, like start doing this work. It's hard work, it's challenging work because you're doing a lot of rewiring, right? And you're rewiring past beliefs and behaviors around food, which you thought had been centered on some really solid science and it's been solid on centered on science. But again, does it have that depth necessarily? And so as you, after we had that conversation, I, I don't remember if it was the next session or the session following and you came back, you're like, I get it. Like there's this thing, this threat state when I'm eating and, and then like, I just saw this like light bulb go off for you and it was amazing. Like, oh, tell me more about that. So can you explain a little I bit about insane. what went on for you? Yeah. So to, to sort of take your listeners through a little bit of my journey, which uh, I'm an open book, doesn't bother me. I'm a coach and I'm happy to tell people what's going on. I know you can't, that's fine. But um, so I am 47. And when I was 45, I got laid off because our company was going through some pretty bad financial downturns. I actually advised the people who laid me off to lay me off. It was the right thing to do. But instead of getting another job, I had a little bit of a severance. So I could actually see if I could make my business fly. It was a really exciting time, but it was also very stressful because I had never had to make money on my own um, without a paycheck since I was 18. So uh, about a year after I left, my business was doing okay. I wasn't feeling super stressed out about my income anymore. Things were rolling, but I was beginning to have these rage issues. <laughs> for lack of a better word, my uh, 16 year old at that time had pulled me aside one time and we were eating out and she was like, what is wrong with you? I guess I snapped at a waitress and I'm not usually like that. Um, so it was not good. I thought that I had been eating too much sugar because I was, you know, feeling fatigued and just, you know, tired. And really I, the things that would make you feel that way were not happening. My business was blooming and things were going in a great way and it was really fun. And I had all this autonomy and I was loving my life, but I didn't feel physically well. So I had read a book about the endocrine system and what happens when you eat too much sugar. And I just went down this rabbit hole and decided that's it. I'm not eating any sugar for five months at the beginning of the year. So January of 2020, I decided to not have any sugar I also own a microbrewery downtown and I decided not to eat, drink any liquor either, which I hadn't been drinking a whole lot anyway, but you know, you taste beer and whatnot. No point in not eating sugar if you're going to continue to drink. And about six months into last year, I started having night sweats and um, trouble sleeping. I was complaining to my husband about how it's so hot in here at night. I can't sleep at all. And he finally looked at me and said, it's not hot. It's not any hotter than it is any other year. And I was like, oh no, way too young, way too young to be going through menopause. So I went to the OB and just had them take my blood and they, I expected they'd say, oh yeah, you're heading into pre-menopause or perimenopause or whatever. And they got the blood test results back and said, oh, you're done. I was like, what? <laughs> you're done. You are done with menopause. You were done with menopause last year. So when I was having those rage issues, apparently I needed some hormones. So um, I had kind of gone down this road of not knowing I was getting into menopause. I was using a birth control that basically made it so you didn't have periods. You didn't really notice any of that. TMI for your listeners, but all the ladies understand this. So I was very surprised. And I was also excited, sort of seeing that I was putting on weight, but it was the year of COVID. You know, everybody jokes about the COVID-19 and I fully embraced that. That it was like, oh, sure. Of course we're going to gain some weight. That's understandable. I'll just do a cleanse like I always do and get it all off about twice a year. I would do a cute little cleanse and that's how I managed to keep my trim little figure. And, uh, yeah, it, I, it, I was not seeing that any of the old ways of functioning were happening. So my body was not responding well to things that I used to easily be able to take off weight. I'm pretty active. I do Pilates four times a week and I have a Peloton now. I do that four times a week. 
So I'm really physically active, but I was not finding it easy to get back into my trimmer old body and it was getting really frustrated. So I connected with you because I knew you had some expertise in this space. And a couple of years ago, I worked with a health coach and had told her I really wanted to get to a space where I don't have to think about eating anymore. I can just feed my body what it needs and not be freaked out about if it's going to make me gain weight or if I'm going to end up being a bigger person and uncomfortable and miserable. And we did some initial work that was really helpful, but I definitely wasn't there. So a lot of what you center your work on being a registered dietitian and a food counselor, you have a lot of expertise in this space to really take uh, most of us who've been coached in this space have done some work to a completely different level, which I have appreciated. So during our time talking together, you and I came to the space where I was finding that I was overeating and I didn't know why. And it was like, I think it's just because it tastes good. And, and you're also like, then eat it, <laughs> enjoy it but be aware of what you're doing. And I know about awareness. I'm a coach, which just for your audience, coaches are the worst people to coach. So I'm, I always tell people who I'm gonna ask to coach me, just be ready. I'm gonna be a massive pain in your ass, but it usually ends up working out okay. Um, <laughs> it, it just was this very frustrating space for me where I kept doing what we were supposed to be doing and I couldn't get into my body to be in a space where I could think. And there were a couple of sessions where I, I was, you know, you were very compassionate and super supportive, but it was so frustrating to me to not understand why can't I take that mindful minute and just think about, do I want to keep eating this or not? I just had this, this space of fog. And as I was talking to you about it, when you were asking me these, these really great wicked questions to help me get to where I needed to have clarity, it all of a sudden dawned on me that when I'm eating, I'm in a threat state that the prospect of having food in front of me in this heavier body that I wasn't enjoying at all um, was, was sort of like reinforcing this concept of me getting heavier and being more unhealthy and all the other stuff that we associate with being heavier, you know, being judged as a professional, as not having your stuff together. And a lot of the things my physician clients deal with, male and female. So all that stuff is kind of going through your head, but it really kind of hit me hard that Oh, that's why I can't think. I coach people about this. So to share with your listeners, without getting into a bunch of neuroscience stuff that nobody probably wants to listen to or hear about, there's a part of your brain that's called the amygdala. Most people know what that is. You've heard about it. It's, a, it's like a little guy in your brain that says, whoa, this is something that can hurt you. And it immediately sends all kinds of neurohormones and chemicals through your bloodstream well, it tells your adrenal glands to do a lot of that. But again, I won't get into this. I just know this isn't super technically accurate, but basically paraphrasing, the amygdala says, this is going to hurt you, be it physically or emotionally and psychologically. And your body goes into a fight or flight state, which most of us are familiar with. And when that happens, the part of your brain where all your genius lives, where you make your rational executive decisions, where you can moderate your emotions goes to sleep. That's called your prefrontal cortex. It's right behind your forehead. This part of the brain that we have since the caveman days actually evolved. That amygdala hasn't evolved at all. It thinks that somebody potentially um, telling you you're not very good at your job is the same as the saber tooth tiger coming to eat you for lunch. It's all the same to the amygdala. It's scared to death of that kind of stuff because it's threatening parts of the brain that are kind of primal to us in our survival. So once I recognized that I was going into a threat state, I, it's like a teeter-totter. When that amygdala is turned on, the genius part of your brain, it can't be accessed very easily. You have to figure out how to get those to actually equalize out and get back in balance so that that other part of your, your parasympathetic nervous system can come back into play and start helping you get back to a place of homeostasis. And that takes a little while. But in the meantime, it was so helpful for me to understand that was happening because when I mean, people talk about you know, when you're about ready to go on stage and do a presentation or a speech, they, you know, talk about having, you know, uh, I just see black. Um, I can't think when I'm in a bad meeting with my boss, I, my words don't work. I just feel like an idiot. Well, they call it your lizard brain. It's the reptilian part of our brain that is so um, almost, you know, prehistoric. It just hasn't evolved much. It doesn't really think it just does. So when you're, you know, you put your hand on an uh, hot stove, your, your brain says to take the hand off. You don't sit there and contemplate, well, 
should I leave my hand on this hot stove or should I take it off? There's no, no contemplation that happens. It's all autonomic processes that your brain just does based on all these habits that we have. So I've been associating eating with not nourishment, not savoring food and taking care of my body. Eating was becoming associated with, oh crap, this is gonna mean I'm gonna get bigger and potentially have to deal with all these hangups that we women oftentimes, and men, um, end up dealing with when we're not feeling like our best selves. So um, I was, you know, that whole thing in the book about people who are thin are oftentimes afraid of becoming fat. And that is just as much of a threat for folks that feel like they are not at the weight they wanna be. Um, food is just this big threat to so many of us because of all the hangups that we've developed really unfortunate, but I was so thrilled to be able to identify that that was what was happening. Because once you understand that, you can begin to engage with those triggers differently and do different things with them and also analyze them differently, which allows your prefrontal cortex to wake back up and help you drive the car in a much more masterful way than um, just, you know, eating because you're scared. How's that? Does that help? Yeah, I think I love how much you pack together there once one, the changes that our bodies go through in perimenopause and menopause. And I, I have a number of other colleagues that are doing work in that like middle aged women space, but having you hearing from you, like pair that together with the neuroscience and that threat state space as well as you being in this, you know, pretty high functioning executive level type position. And so one of the things that I remember we talked about is, you know, one of those threats is, well, if I gain weight, then I won't be seen as, as professional, or I won't be seen as healthy to these doctors that I'm, which I'm trying to reach out to. Um, I won't be seen as competent, you know, all of those things. And, and I think that happens in a lot of different people, no matter what profession that they're working in kind of ties back around to that imposter syndrome too. And that if our bodies are, don't meet the social acceptability and the social ideal, then are we imposters at our job? Are we imposters as, oh, as mom, you're, you're a mom of three, three girls. And so are you showing up as a mom, the best that you want to, if your body changes and it looks like this. And so there's so much wrapped up into that, that plate of food that's right in front of us. And we toss all oh, of the, those beliefs and all of those assumptions onto that plate of whatever. And so you're right to be able to to put that connection around like, oh, this is what's really happening. I'm really scared of the weight gain based on your internalized weight stigma and your internalized fat phobia that you have about yourself. And, and I don't think that we're getting better about talking about that part, uh, you know, the weight stigma and the internalized fat phobia, but in pretty small circles, but even people, like you said, people that are, have thin privilege are in smaller bodies. There's this pretty big fear, this pretty big threat of what will it be like if my body gets bigger? And that's because as a culture, we put so much negativity on people that are in larger bodies and we make all these gross assumptions around their, uh, their ability to work and their ability to take care of themselves and all of this other crap that we just make these assumptions that because someone's in a larger body, they don't, they don't take care of themselves or they're not worthy. That's really what it boils down to. Lindo Bacon goes into that as you, as you've read a lot in her, in the book, health at every size and body respect with Lucy Affermore. Um, And I've just started reading a little sidebar radical acceptance, which is Lindo's new book. So add that to anybody's reading list, because it takes this where health at every size and body respect, those books are directly centered on this um, weight stigma, fat phobia, um, kind of the flipping the research, the health research on its head, so to speak. Radical acceptance goes even broader than that to just talking about acceptance for all bodies, all genders, all sexualities, all colors, ethnicities, all of that, and was really getting into 
connection and how important it is for us to feel connected as humans and feel seen as humans. And without going into a lot more details, but there were even some parts in the book that were also coming back around to this threat state of when you're not connected or when you don't feel seen. Yes. And and I, as I was reading it, I was like, oh, whoa, like she's talking about relating to other humans. But what about if humans are relating to their own body and if they don't feel like, you know, their mind can't see compassionately their body, what is that going to do to how they're taking care of themselves or how they feel like they can take care of themselves? And, you know, there's nuances around that, of course, and, and tons of privilege nuances that come into that too and agency and all of that. So again, that could be almost a whole nother a whole nother show just on that book for sure. Um, but I love how you brought all of those pieces together. One of the classic, oh, my body is changing. Therefore I must go fix it. I feel like crap. I must go fix that. That's what our culture oh, yeah. says. That's says that, you know, you have all this empowerment to go fix this. And where we do for the most part have empowerment to go take care of ourselves. Yes, that's true. But there are things that your body's going to go through in your life, whether you like it or not. And especially as, as women and with the way our biology is designed, like, and, and men go through their version of this as well. I should also mention that, but bodies just in general are going to change over time. They're going to go through puberty and there's going to be a shit storm of hormones there. If a woman gets pregnant, they're going to go through a whole shit storm of hormones there and body changes and then on into perimenopause and menopause. And so we cannot fix that. Like that's just the way that a body evolves. A body is not supposed to be 65 years old and still functioning like it was 25. It's not supposed to. But as a culture, we say, oh, well, why not? It can, why, why can't it be? And, you know, we push for that. So I love how you had that experience. And I remember you saying this when we first started working together of going through the whole sugar thing, you mentioned doing the cleanses. And of course, as you can imagine, like all these bells and whistles are going off in my head. <laughs> like, we got to get this girl some sugar. Like we got to, we got to have some cookie challenges or <laughs> some brownie challenges, which we did. Yeah. But, and that's one of the, the steps to breaking that threat state, because that other threat state, as we talked about is, is not having permission and not having the habituation with food, because that's another thing that that primal part of your brain will go, oh, there's not enough food. Oh, well, now she's going to give me food. I better get it all right now because it may not be there tomorrow, whether that's an amount of food or a type of food. And so when you're able to, like you said, recognize where is this threat coming from? Is it coming from the actual like access to the food? Is it coming from these other societal ideals that I'm trying to live up to? Is it coming from just the discomfort of my body's changing and I don't sleep well because I'm hot and then I'm cold and then this and then that and my kids piss me off. Like there's so much that comes together in in this space of being middle-aged women, especially, and to be able to identify that and normalize, well, part of our responses is biology and is neuroscience. I think it was just such, it was a brilliant moment for me too. It was like this aha moment, like, yes, that's like, you put language to everything that I talk about with clients and what their experience is like. And like, why do I feel threatened by this plate of whatever. And why do I not feel threatened by, we'll just use some food examples here, just purely as example, but why do I not feel threatened by a plate of salad? But I do feel threatened by a burger, fries, and a brownie. It's mm -hmm. all, and I think you and I had this conversation going, it's just carbohydrates, protein, fat, yeah. got some antioxidants thrown in there on both plates, uh -huh. by the way. I think we had this conversation around brownies and said, Janelle, it's just carbohydrates. It was cookies. cookies. It was chocolate cookies. Very <laughs> fascinating. That whole food equal morality discussion around the, the anti-deprivation work that we did, because I had been dueling a lot with deprivation in order to stay slimmer. And I'm not even like a very big person in general. I'm tall and I exercise a lot. I have a lot of muscle and I feel really good. But I, that extra kind of weight over that, you know, we 
we tend to make up a lot, I think, in the society that if we eat whatever we think we should or our brain tells us we should, we are going to become these, you know, morbidly obese people that have to be craned out of their homes that we see on TV. And that's not accurate. I, I mean that, but there's some some stuff in there that really can kind of freak us out. So yeah, when I was on this 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 trail you brought me through where we really needed to do some anti-deprivation work where things were not off limits to me because um, you had explained to me, of course you want to eat all those cookies. Your brain is wondering when you're going to put the next cleanse in and give it another cookie famine, which I thought was hilarious. Um, <laughs> but that made sense too. It's like that anti-deprivation, the caveman days of those primal instincts of starvation. It, the brain doesn't know how to understand that, no, we live in America. None of us are, you know, most of us, I shouldn't say none of us these days, but a lot of us are not going to have to worry about starvation. So it was, it was a, a really cool way for me to understand um, what was going on there. But um, those, those cleanses have set up a pattern of every six months, we go back on a cleanse and then we reboot. I used to call them reboots because I would get my little habits back in check and I would start eating clean again. But why did I always end up back where I was? If that is the way that I was enjoying living, I am a mom who loves to bake. I have three daughters who, and a husband who also loves to eat all the stuff I bake. And that's a big part of the relational aspect of living in this house is mom bakes. And so I just, it always just sucked to me to not be able to do that and not be able to enjoy those things with my family, which was a big part of us just enjoying life is chocolate chip cookies. I make the best chocolate chip cookies. So that was a big piece we had to kind of reframe. And a lot of the ladies I talked to in my peer group and um, friends who are a little older than me by about 10 years, I'd say most of them have been through menopause and they're in their fifties had told me, oh yeah, I noticed right away, I would start packing on weight if I ate. And I'm like, what do you mean if you eat? And uh, many of them would tell me, I just don't really eat anymore. I kind of just, you know, I'll graze a little here and there, but I don't, I can't eat more than one meal a day. If I do, my weight just shoots up. And these are people like me who work out all the time and exercise well, not obsessively or anything, but they, they know it's, it's healthy. It makes you feel good to stay active and they eat okay, um, but they just don't eat much. And it just, it just began to dawn on me. I don't want to live like that. I don't, I don't want to live like that. And, it, and so some of those, those triggers that were coming into play that were putting me into a threat state where I was feeling like, oh no, these big fears of becoming heavier. Some of the stuff you mentioned that we make up about what other people think of us. I mean, the, the physicians I work with are lovely and they, they do not tend to judge. From what I can tell, they think I'm just amazing and they're, they're super great and they judge themselves a ton. But you know, there's leaders who I'm contracting with, who I talk with, who are like, oh, it looks like you lost some weight. So then your brain goes, oh, they notice whether or not I weigh more or less. And no, they're trying to give you a compliment. They're trying to be you know kind and empowering or whatever, because they're on their own weight journey. That's what it's really about. But in the back of my brain, you know, there's these little stories running. Oh, you better look like you got your stuff together if you want to be seen as a credible contractor who can actually um, speak to what you're doing. When really the size of my body has nothing to do with the way in which I coach. It has nothing to do with the intel and the subject matter expertise that I have developed over the last couple decades in this space. It's just an additional narrative that's rolling. That's just a distraction. So, yeah, I mean, and I can share with you some of the tool if you want me to. What do you think? Yeah, you? yeah. What let's dive think? into that. The scarf, isn't it? Scarf tool. Yeah. Just the scarf tool. Yeah. Just yes. like your lovely Again, scarf that you're wearing. All right. I've got my <laughs> scarf on, looking, looking dapper. Um, so there's, a, it's an acronym, and this is a neuroscience tool that was created by David Rock. And I went to a coach training at the Neuroleadership Institute. That's where... I didn't learn about SCARF. I knew about it before that. A uh, leader introduced it to us back in like 2010. It's been around for a little over a decade. Um, but we learned about it there in the, in the aspect of coaching and how you can help your clients really relax that amygdala part of the brain so that you can access all the creativity in that prefrontal cortex just by simple little things you're doing while you're coaching. And it has to do with just an awareness about these five areas, but it really plays into us as humans and how we interact with stressors and triggers in our lives 
based on what our brain is telling us is dangerous. So to break down the acronym, S stands for status. So anytime, and these are all, these are all psychological and emotional threats. So not, you know, getting hit by a boss or something that's physically going to harm you, which we tend to all associate with fight or flight. We go into fight or flight when we have psychological or emotional threats too. So status is the first one. And that talks about, you know, it's, it's, a little bit about folks kind of associated with, you know, do I have a pretty, a big house and a fancy car um, where we can be more showy, where we're, we're comparing ourselves to others and how do we measure up? And the brain does love to compare. And I tell my clients all the time, comparison is a thief of all joy. It does not bring you anything helpful, but the brain does these things as it's part of its organizing principle on whether or not something's good or bad. So status kind of gets to this very primal space for us about credibility and whether or not we can be seen as someone who is trusted to be able to perform and do our job well. For physicians, there are status threats all over the place in their work. They have all this subject matter expertise to consult. And if some patient comes in with their WebND um, you know, thing they, they rolled off about, well, my, my, my web search says this, and these physicians are like, great. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of that going on, which they're managing, but in the leadership space, they're oftentimes having to deal with, am I good enough to lead these people? Cause I've never been taught how to lead. And all of us as leaders learn how to lead by leading. There's not really some magic class you can go to. I don't care how many MBAs you have. You're still not necessarily good at leading. Um, it's just a real big trial and error space. So those status threats of making mistakes and being able to continue to move forward and learn from them is a big one for them. But we as humans are always going to feel threatened by anything that makes it look like we could lose our job. And that's a lot wrapped up in status. You're not good enough. You're not competent. You made a mistake, which is great. That's how we learn. But we don't oftentimes have the, the growth mindset to be able to apply that. So that's status. And that kind of comes back to like Maslow's hierarchy of need. If you think back to your Psych 101 class, the base of that hierarchy is shelter and food. And if you feel like you're going to lose your job, your amygdala is basically saying you're going to go live in a van by the river and no one's ever going to want to hire you again. Your kids are not going to have a roof over their heads. No one's going to have shoes. And these are things that are very irrational, but they're kind of happening in the background on a bit of a subconscious level. Super hard on us as humans those stressors can do things like throw you in a menopause really early. <laughs> so I like to tell people, don't minimize the things that physical stress can do to your body when you, you don't really need to reproduce in this environment. We can be done with that. Um, those things are real. They're physical and they manifest in ways that are actually pretty harmful to our nervous system and lots of other things. So that's status. Anytime we have an interaction with someone that leaves us feeling less than positive or neutral about those kinds of things, can a light that amygdala and get that part of your brain going that makes you get into this place where you have cortisol running through an adrenaline, running through your bloodstream, that your brain thinks you're about ready to run or kick somebody's butt and you're not. It's the same physiological um, situation that you end up in though. So that's S, C stands for certainty. Big one, this last year, I don't really have to talk much about that. Anytime the brain cannot predict something or have the ability to forecast what's coming down the road. Brain doesn't like to be blindsided. And, um, you know, folks have different levels of sensitivity to each of these five areas, I would say. Some of us are much more sensitive to certainty threats than others. Um, but that is a big one for the brain. The brain, everybody needs to have some semblance of normalcy, predictability, the ability to, to be okay with what's going to happen down the road. Some of us do much better in change situations than others. We kind of like the change in the variety, other people are paralyzed by it. So recognizing that that can be really hard on folks, no matter how much we say, be resilient, figure out how to adapt. Those are all great qualities, but that's not really the reality of most people's situations. They're living in a space of this threat state on a daily basis over the last year. And for some, it's been longer than that because of other triggers that are you know, going through our brains with all the stuff that's going on in the world. So that's certainty. A stands for autonomy. That's a big one for me. So anytime we are being, we are feeling like things are being done to us or we don't have choice, 
Um, some people use the word control, and I would say that's, that's valid, but a lot of people who get triggered by autonomy are not necessarily controlling people. Um, they just want to be able to have the, the opportunity to have agency over their lives and what's happening. So that's a really big one for physicians. They do not have a lot of autonomy over the choices they get to make in their diagnostic decisions because they now have to think about, well, is the insurance going to cover it? Is this something that from a financial strategic initiative, I'm really going to be supported to, to prescribe or leverage or not? So there's, there's autonomy threats all over the place in healthcare for physicians, and there have been for some time. So this is the kind of stuff that's, that's really getting them to a place where a lot of them feel like they're trapped. They are a bit hamstrung by a lot of their student loans, which are insanely high, especially for medical school. And if they get into a place where the work is not a great fit for them, it's kind of too late. So that's a big reason, among many, many other reasons, why a lot of them are burning out and committing suicide at a higher rate than any other profession as something around 400 per year um, before the pandemic happened, which is just, it's so, so sad and insane. So once you recognize what some of these triggers are and where they're coming from, we can help these physicians actually interact with these triggers differently so they can... Um, do things about them to have autonomy again. And that settles that amygdala space down and they don't feel like crap as much anymore. It's actually much better. So that's autonomy. R is relatedness. That has a lot to do with the brain's organizing principle around is someone different than me or the same as me. There's a little bit of that implicit bias stuff that comes into the brain there where people see different as bad or threatening which we can all undo in ourselves if our brain has developed those kinds of neural pathways that we just need to build new ones over them if that's where we are. And we do work with folks on that too. But you know, it's also about whether or not you're able to maintain harmony with your crew and um, the people around you. And that, that is a big trigger for folks who are feelers, uh, really humans in general, but many people who are leading who really need to address folks and their behavior that's not serving anyone well, really hard to do that for the fear of a relatedness threat. If that person decides they're going to hate me now, now I'm going to have to work with them and it's going to be weird, or they're going to go tell other people that I'm terrible and I'll become ostracized. So that relatedness threat is primal too. That goes back to the caveman days when, you know, if you were ostracized from the clan, you didn't get to sleep in the cave, you died of exposure. So kind of back to that deprivation with food stuff, a lot of this stuff that the brain's doing makes sense. That amygdala is doing what we paid it to do, is trying to keep us safe. But in the risk tolerance space of helping people, it also keeps you small, which is not what most people are here to be, is small. So keeping that in mind, it's a normal process. All of us have to deal with this. It's very predictable. So the last one to wrap is F and that's fairness. And fairness triggers run amok for us as people individually when things are being done to us that aren't fair. Um, you know, we, we associate fairness with kids a lot, but quite honestly, most corporate cultures I have come in contact with have a pretty strong trigger when it comes to things not being done fairly and for understandable reasons. Tons of this work in uh, racial inequity, when you're talking about other groups of people that you may not even personally associate with, you can become very triggered by this, depending upon where your values are and what you are aspiring to make the world a better place around. If you're highly altruistic, you can have big fairness triggers when you don't feel like people are given the opportunity to excel. Um, if you have lower altruism values and you believe that people should pick themselves up by their bootstraps and figure it out on their own, you're gonna have fairness triggers when the government's trying to put things in place that are gonna actually give money away. So there's, it doesn't really matter what you believe. There's no good or bad in this. It just is what it is. There's just different ways that people are gonna come at things based on what they value. No judgment, it just is what it is. So that's a big, that's one of the tools that we leverage in our programs for doctors that are all, that are based on neuroscience. That is, that has been pretty helpful for folks to be able to compartmentalize things differently and see that there's ways to actually make things um, better for themselves in the way in which they interact with those triggers. Yeah, I love what that I leave tool. Out. No, I think it, you covered it all for sure. And I, what I, as I was listening to you, and I remember when you, you told me this for the, the first time in one of our sessions, and as you were describing what each letter stood for, I was like, oh, that food there, 
food there. Oh, body size. Oh, food. Like, uh, so as you were describing it in relation to the physicians and uh, executive level professionals that you work with, I'm also hearing it from that just individual perspective when it comes to food and body. So status, it felt like status was fairly similar to like what you're talking about from a professional space of status. But just like we mentioned earlier, you know, status around body size, status around youth versus getting older status and, you know, in appearance along those lines, especially, um, I see it more played out in women, but I, I suspect that men are not immune to this either as they age. So status more around that physical appearance. Um, and then the certainty around, are you going to give yourself full permission with the brownies and the cookies or not? Is the body certain that it, those will always be there? Or what about the bag of chips or the bread or the pasta? Um, and that's kind of where that played out for me too. Um, autonomy, for sure. Like if we don't have food autonomy choices, which is what dieting does. Like when you were on your cleanses, there's no autonomy there. Like, Oh, do I get this juice or do I get this juice? It's all juice. It's not, do I get juice or do I get a burger or do I get the tacos or do I get the pizza? Like the, any diet, there's no autonomy. It's a list of rules to follow and you follow it and you quote unquote, get results or you don't follow it. And you're quote unquote, a failure. Like there's no autonomy in that. And relatedness, I think kind of to me, as I was listening to you, I might have to wrap my brain around this a little bit more, but it seemed like it kind of went back up towards related to status too, around who do we connect to based on appearance? And this could go into, you know, the racial conversation, but also the body size uh, you know, do I relate to people that are in different body sizes than me or different abilities than me, physical abilities? Um, that's where that kind of came up too. And then fairness, I think we're seeing fairness play out uh, or conversations around fairness play out in so many different aspects of life over the last year, for sure. And I wonder too, around the fairness to me, that's almost like where the, the body complimenting comes into, you know, that if someone gets a compliment, because like you were mentioning, you had lost some weight after one of your cleanses and you receive this compliment. Okay. Well, how is that being fair to the person's whose body is exactly the same? And they've still been trying to do all these things to take care of themselves, but their body hasn't changed. So why is that, is that fair for you to get like this almost elevation in status because your yeah. body has changed versus someone that is just might be perceived as just going along through the motions and they don't get recognized or they don't get complimented, whatever, or worse, if, if their body has changed the other direction and they've gained weight, do they get shamed around that? What's the fairness in that? So just fairness around body sizes and what we see as acceptable and beautiful and worthy in our culture too. So yeah, I think that we could almost put like a parallel scarf model with yeah. <laughs> as it relates to food and body too. And and honestly, it's it's somewhat similar to the technique that I use with clients around savor and that those were, those letters all mean something. And it's meant to be more of a tool that you can stop in the moment and walk yourself through. Okay. Why is my hand on the pantry door? What am I needing right now? But it can be into a broader context too of like, why do I feel like I need to diet? Why do I feel like I need to change my body or fix my body? Becoming aware of why you think that you need to do that, where those beliefs come from, um, cultural or family or professional, what have you, and then validating, oh, that's where those beliefs come from. It's all normal. It's part of the human experience. It's part of the shitty parts of diet culture. That's where it comes from. And then having, bringing up options. Okay, well, now we have this awareness that this is this is where we're at from a cultural standpoint and and validating that now what options do you have to take care of yourself in the moment they don't all have to be glamorous they don't have to be expensive they don't have to take a bunch of time but you're checking in with yourself and saying well this i'm i'm gonna eat lunch today I'm gonna have a snack today 
And if I want the brownie, mm-hmm. I'm going to have the brownie, like validating or giving yourself options of how you can take care of yourself. And that might be moving. It might be some downtime with a book. It might be hanging out with kids or playing with the dog, you know, it can be all different options. And then reflecting and releasing on what did you choose to take care of yourself in that moment that you were feeling that kind of ugh about your body or about food. Um, and no matter, again, no judgment. I love how you were saying that as you were walking through scarf too. It's just noticing like, these are some real, real parts about being human and work working through the saber technique is similar. And the getting to that reflect and release, it's just saying, Hey, did you hit the mark of where you wanted to be or how you wanted to take care of yourself? No judgment. You did, or you didn't. Okay. What do we want to do different next time? Or what do we want to do the same? Maybe you did. You're like, Oh yeah, it was just so grounding to just kind of lay on the floor and just feel the weight of my body in the floor. Super. Let's do that again next time. Let's file that away so that when you feel threatened by food Mm -hmm. or your body, that we can come back into ourselves and back into our embodiment through the saver technique. And similar to how you walk people through scarf, like having these notices of what's going on from a neurological perspective with you, then does that give us almost a step, uh, an ability to step forward? Again, not step forward because we're judging ourselves or thinking we should do it differently, but it just doesn't keep us stuck in sitting. Yeah. One of my uh, colleagues who she was on last week, Body Image with Brie, Brianna Campos, and she her whole work, it's all around body image. And we talk so much about sitting in the suck and you have to sit in the suck of, of, not liking where you are in order to, to move forward. You have to have that validation and that awareness of like, oh, I'm here. And why am I here? Oh, cultural ideals or professional ideals or whatever. Um, So we have to recognize where we're at, but the hope would be that you don't sit in the suck for forever, you know, sit there as long as you need to. But, you know, as humans, we like to to hope that people can get out of that place because it feels really awful to be in that space. So what can we do to help all of ourselves help us get out of the suck, either as just supportive human beings or coaches or um, nutrition counselors? Like how do we, how do we help all of everybody involved in this diet culture society you know, move forward with their lives. So I, I am so excited to learn more about scarf and, you know, from that, those, the bigger picture scarf, which relates to any incidences in our life, like you said, any related threat states, but then how it can even tie even more into food and body. Cause when you were mentioning that for the first time, I was like, Oh, Hey, now what is this? This is some new continuing <laughs> education right here for me. I got to learn some more yeah. about this. This is really a cool, cool model. Um, and I just see it over and over again. And all of my clients, like where they might be in the scarf model And I'm almost wondering too, like noticing where someone is in the scarf tool and then being able to apply savor in the moment to get them out Mm -hmm. of that state. I don't know. That might be something worth possibly poking around. I mean, I've learned I've I've enhanced my understanding of that tool just listening to you because I had never applied it to the space before. So in in, any we talked about my hangups really a big part of was put me into a threat state was lack of certainty when i had a plate of food in front of me about me being healthy because i lost my dad when i was 15 he was 49 of a heart attack and he was super fit and thin um so i just always kind of felt like i have to stay healthy or else i'm going to die and that's a big part of the certainty you gave me was the research that says no there's like zero correlation that's actually valid that says if you weigh more that you are unhealthy. I mean, there's other factors that come into play. And that that was a, a certainty reward. So on the flip side of all these threats, your brain also is able to take in rewards at each of these spaces. Um, but I won't go into because we don't have time. But that was super, super helpful for me. And all the autonomy re- rewards I've been given through your work in this anti-deprivation space, where now I was talking to a friend a couple of weeks ago, who's super, you know, really wants sugar all the time and is feeling bad about herself. And I was like, yeah, I don't, I got to tell you after working through this, like I eat it, but I don't crave it anymore. 
I mean, it's not just hormones. I've had sugar issues my entire life um, because it's just, I know I can always have it. It's not that special anymore. I still like it. I still enjoy it, but there's so much autonomy in this space that really thinking about living my postmenopausal life, which is probably another, you know, 40, 50 years, I would just have to be living in deprivation in order to be healthy, meaning thin, um, was really, really hard to stomach. So you gave all of that back to me without even understanding this tool. Like I get it and I'm able to compartmentalize it in different ways. It has really helped me move beyond the space of rumination to a place where I feel empowered and um, less likely to be all worried about my body. Yeah. And I, I don't think we give enough uh, credit to our, the sensitivity of our bullshit meter as we go through perimenopause and menopause. And I was just at the, the doctor the other day and we were chatting about hormonal stuff. Cause I'm in that space now too. And, and I was, we were talking about that rage aspect and she goes, you know, having a sensitive bullshit meter is not a bad thing. Like she was trying to talk me out of, she's like, I get that. Yeah. Okay. We want to try to be compassionate and take care of ourselves and, and not lash out at the waiter or the the grocery clerk or our partners, our families, whatever she said, but there's also this somewhat beauty when we come into this stage of middle age and saying like, that's bullshit. I'm not going to live my life like that anymore. And like you said, when yeah. you have these 40 or 50 years more of, of living post menopause, then why would you want to keep living with only eating one meal a day? I don't. You only, you only, <laughs> no, but you know, again, that ties back to like, well, you know, why are people doing that? Why are women doing that? It's because they're so afraid of gaining weight. They're so threatened by gaining weight because that's what our culture says. And they're, they're threatened with getting old too. Um, you yeah. Know, so, but just being able to recognize that and go, Oh, this is why, okay. Do we want to stay in that space again? Do we want to stay in that suck? of feeling like you're always on the edge of like, I got to stay in control of this. Or do you want to enjoy some food with your family and have connections? Because all of that's pretty fleeting. Is that, Mm -hmm. do you really want to be dodging that for the next 40, 50 years? I don't think so. I don't think most people do. Yeah. No. And as it turns out, we're not going to turn into, you know, thousand pound people. Um, because we're listening to our bodies and actually giving it what it is looking for. But I have actually, I'm not gaining weight. It's very stable in this space, which is totally counterintuitive to what we've always learned. My set point changed when I went through menopause. It doesn't really matter what I'm eating. My body is metabolizing it and doing what it needs to do. It, it's kind of fascinating actually. So you, yeah. you've helped me tremendously with that. And I'm much more accepting in this space too. I don't stress out about these things anymore which is lovely. And that acceptance too, of even if someone did become that thousand pound person that has to be, you know, lifted out of the house by the crane, you know, those terrible reality TV shows that we say, which is so shaming to people in larger bodies is having that acceptance around like, even if that's what my body did, even that's what, if if that's what it's decided to do through giving it its autonomy, I'm still a worthy human being and I still deserve respect and I deserve, still deserve to be considered a professional or worthy of love and all of those things. And we have to have that level of respect and acceptance for all body sizes in order to continue on with our own internal um, journey and wrapping it around how yeah. bodies have changed. Because the truth is we don't honestly know how bodies bodies will change. We start to know more about like some of the hormonal pieces, but you could get injured and then have to be on some type of medication and the medication changes your body size dramatically. I mean, there's so many different things that can happen in our lives through the human experience that can cause body changes. So we can, we can just be open to, yep, here's my body today. I don't know what it's going to look like tomorrow, but I'm open to taking care of it and showing up for her as best that we can. So this has been such a great, just, great conversation. Like, no, I know, but I feel like we make up that that's not the case, that if we use intuitive eating, that's that whole, I'm letting go, I'm letting go of everything. I'm not like taking care of myself when in reality, no, it's actually, the, it's lessening a boatload of stress that was 
running through your veins before that now I don't feel like I'm in a threat state when I'm eating food anymore. And And that's that's what you're letting go of. You're letting go of the threat state. And so when people come at you with those comments of like, oh, what intuitive eating? Oh, like that's just, you know, really letting your body go. I'm like, yeah, I'm letting go of being threatened by food. Like, why wouldn't you want to let go of that? It's ridiculous. But yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, If people want to learn more about your work, um, the work that you do with executive professionals, and even just a little bit more about like this type of neuroscience, where can they find out more about what you're doing? Oh, well, we can be found at footlampconsulting.com, F-O-O-T-L-A-M-P, consulting.com. That's our website. It talks a little bit about our programs, our signature programs for physicians, as well as other business professionals. Um, we can be accessed that way. We also do a gratitude practice email for folks if they're interested. It's, it's a Monday through Friday email. It's my three good things that I send out every Monday through Friday. And you don't ever have to open the email or interact with it, but it helps you remember to stop and think about what's going well. It's a little primitive inquiry. You get some nice dopamine and some serotonin, which we could all use. Um, so that's an easy way too, to just kind of get onto some of this movement and move forward. We typically um, contract with medical groups. So if any of the listeners know a leader of a medical group who's concerned about the welfare of their physicians, uh, feel free to reach out and let us know um, that you're interested. We'd be happy to talk a little bit more about what we can do to support your folks. Yeah, that's awesome. And I love your gratitude emails. I think they're just, they're great. They're just short little nuggets. And like you said, it causes people to stop and get into the present moment. And particularly if they can read them, like one of their first emails of the day or something like that, I feel like it can just set the tone for, for a day, which is really cool. I'm so glad you're doing that. It's awesome. Super. Well, thanks for being here, Janelle. It's uh, always great to chat. And I I think we could have, we could have many more conversations and and many more uh, little nuanced uh, episodes here and there, but Thanks so much for being here today. I appreciate you taking the time and we will chat again soon. Well, thanks for having me and thank you for the work you're doing. I'm actually really thrilled to have you on our team now as well. So we can offer your services to physicians and other leadership professionals that are struggling in this space because I can't help them with this stuff, but boy, you sure can. So thank you. That is a true honor for sure. I'm excited to, to be able to do a little bit more with your folks and hopefully help them like just enjoy their lunch in the middle of a crazy busy day. Like, can we just have lunch? Maybe that'll be my tagline as part of your coaching staff. Amanda just wants you to sit down and have lunch. (laughs) Amanda said, eat lunch, please. (laughs) Yes. All right. Well, we will see you all again soon. Thanks so much for tuning in and listening and we will catch you on another episode. Take care.